يلا يلا like it hardly takes 2 minutes like once you record on a system like google drive you can upload within 2 minutes and then yeah okay i think um, still a bar is there on the screen to him and that should be gone yeah this is good now okay wonderful let me the bar there's going to be one more bar going to come up because mm -hmm. i need to uh make sure that the notifications don't pop up That's the other thing. <laughs> There should be I like a here we go. There's a focus button. Period words. No, no, it should be more than that. Okay. How's that? Is that clear? Yeah. I think okay. we're good. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, hello, everyone. Once again, we're back after one week. And today, we're going to get a little deeper into the topic of using nanotechnology for for quantum purposes. Well, we're, we're going to talk about some, some pretty good concepts. I think that'll have a lot of animations, kind of like what we had last time, and you'll you'll get a much better idea of what these terms mean, and then we'll move on to, you know, some other things that are I, that I think are important when we're considering building a a nanoscale device. So, welcome, and my name is Henri J. Benali here at the University of Minnesota in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. And my principal investigator is Professor Jianping Wang. And so here we go. This is the table of contents here. Uh, basically, we're gonna introduce some motivation, some background on um, why some of these things are important. And then we're also going to talk about this idea of seeing atoms as Lego bricks, because perhaps you've seen these, these um, somewhat toy items in everyday life, or maybe you've seen them in the media. There's, there were also some movies made about Legos, the Lego movie. <laughs> And I think that you can see Legos as atoms. So we're going to talk about some of those things. And then we're also going to talk about the comparison between what we see as dots on the microscope versus the real atoms themselves. Because there, there is some correlation between the two, and there are some differences to take note of. And then we're going to talk about basically the order versus disorder. If something is crystalline, it looks a certain way. If it's amorphous, it looks a certain way. We'll point those things out. And then we'll move on to the key ingredients for multi-layered thin films. And then, like, what, what, what is the requirement to make those thin films work together with each other? And then some barriers. Um, this is kind of a subsection of the key ingredients, but there are barriers to take note of because there's a lot of control in thin films. And then inspirations from nature, kind of briefly over, take, take an overview from here. And then we'll see some, some nice pictures again. And then a conclusion. So here on the right, this is kind of my signature style, but there are there's a, pit, there's a picture of a chip here, and this chip has quantum dots on it. And it's been fabricated in a laboratory, and basically the purpose of this chip here is just to act as a photo detector. What does that mean? It means... If, if there are some kind of uh, a certain wavelengths of photons, or it depends on the person who designed and built this chip, maybe they designed it to detect a certain wavelength of light or maybe a wide range of light, um, light wavelengths, then that, that's, the sur that's the purpose of this chip here. And then it has these wire bonds, these leads here that will allow you to detect a small, small electrical 
um, signal from the chip. And then you can you can plot that on a graph and then you know count the number of you can try to count the number of photons or maybe you can uh, populate data on a, on a graph or, or do something with it. There, there are different kind of projects for that. So this is just what that chip is. It has, in this case, uh, quantum technology in it. <laughs> so here's, a, here's an interesting start. This is a poem that I wrote some time ago. And basically it talks about uh, nanotechnology. I'll read it to you. <laughs> this, will, this will give us a good idea, a good start. Imagine it's like playing with Lego bricks, except the bricks are atoms of solids. That's how we build nanotechnology. We play with atoms and stack them together, like interlinkable bricks. Sometimes we can melt, quote unquote, those bricks together, and this is called diffusion. So, maybe I... I mean, hopefully I put a, a nice picture in your head, but <laughs> there, there's this melting thing that goes on, and then we'll go over those. So as far as the background of, of, of working on thin films, I mean, the idea is that we are trying to build a nanoscale objects that is 100 nanometers or less, and it's, it's agreed within the community that if something is about 100 nanometers or less, it is considered nanoscale. So even if you have an object or a device or a structure that is like 300 nanometers or 700 or 800 nanometers, then it is still, <laughs> funny enough, it is considered micron scale. It is micro <laughs> We consider that micro scale simply because, well, we, uh, we, we can control or we can fabricate those objects of that size using photonics, well, in this case, uh, laser technology, advanced laser technology. And it really doesn't matter whether or not it's patterned directly on the chip or if it's done through a mask-based system. Regardless, if it's if it's greater than 100 nanometers, then <laughs> there's, there's actually a pretty sharp line there that you have to cross to consider uh, the difference between nanoscale and microscale. And then the other, the other important thing to note is here... Uh, 100 nanometers of a device could be could just be the vertical direction. So the thin film itself, if you're growing it on a on a substrate on a chip, then 100 nanometers should be at least one of those dimensions. It could be the lateral direction or even maybe the 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 vertical direction. In most cases, it is the vertical direction. So the one here on the left and you could have micron scale uh, dimensions on the on the sides of the device. So from from left to right, you can have micron scale, but at least one of those has to be in this range. And then, on the other hand, on the flip side, you can have a nanometer device that is that is basically less than hundred nanometers, both vertically and laterally. So that means in in all directions, X, Y, Z direction, it can be 100 nanometers, and that would that would definitely count as a nanoscale device. <laughs> so the point here is that there, there are kind of there are two two types of or two different directions that you can take a nanoscale device, and both count as as part of thin film nanotechnology. It's it's under that category, but of course uh, maybe maybe this is obvious. But if there is a micro scale device, it's micro scale from left to right, you know, lateral direction, and it's micron scale in the vertical direction. So anything greater than 100 nanometers, and it's 100 nano, you know, greater than 100 nanometers left to right, then that is a micro scale device. Then it's in that case, it's it's not as easy to get quantum effects out of that kind of um, out of those kind of dimensions. So just to make that clear. And then the other thing is when we have a when we're building a, a quantum device, it needs you know a lot of inspection and sometimes we we can introduce impurities or defects on purpose. And sometimes those defects and impurities they they 
get mixed into the device somehow um, through diffusion and other things, you know, quote unquote melting, things like that. So we, we want to be able to control those things, whether if it's desired or undesired. So that, that's all, that's a lot of material science involved. And it also, of course, involves a lot of tearing down and building up of these uh, different kinds of, well, in this case, metals, insulators, or a combination of metals, insulators, and semiconductors. So there are also other two directions here. You can, you can make a device that only has metals and insulators, but no semiconductors. You can build a device like the ones that we build in my laboratory. We use only metals and insulators. So what does that mean? We have, well, different kinds of uh, ferromagnets, for example, or uh, some, some other novel kind of magnet. But regardless, it's, it's not, we're not mixing any kind of semiconductor inside of that device. It's only these two material, these two types of materials, and then some others, but no semiconductors. <clears throat> so uh, the most common one is this combination here on the left, I mean, on the right, excuse me. So these three. Now, here's a, <laughs> now we can see some Legos. The, on the right, this is a, an animation that I made. This is a GIF. And there's a program called Tinkercad, actually. If you go to tinkercad.com, or was it .org? Just go to Tinkercad. It's a website. And that, that CAD program allows you to create 3D models from, from the, within the browser. And it's, it's free, free to use. You can learn how to do 3D modeling from there. And you can design a device on there. And then there's a small button on the upper right of that page. It looks like a Lego brick. And when you press that button, it will allow you to generate a, a 3D model of Lego bricks out of that shape that you make. So in this case, what I drew is a, a quantum device, a magnetic tunnel junction. And it's in the shape of uh, all these little Lego bricks. <laughs> and you can see on the left side, there's a, there's a sort of combination of, well, in this case, cake. But the cake is made out of, or actually it's the other way. The Lego shapes in this cake is, is made out of, well, the, the cake components in this case. So, <laughs> mm. And the, the other interesting thing to note, you can kind of, view this as an artistic representation is that if we were to imagine each of these Lego bricks as atoms, then it kind of makes sense too, because atoms actually do have various sizes. Some are bigger than others. Some are, some have a greater mass than others, thing, things like that. So, oh, someone wants to, someone wants me to write the GIF the name of the gift. Okay, we'll we'll get to that part. No worries. Maybe maybe I will draw that um, in the end. Please ask me that question again, because right now, if I bring something up, then it's going to put a little bar on the screen to get in the way. So we'll uh, I'll show you. Don't don't worry about it. I yeah yeah, but just remind me at the end. We'll we'll talk about it. Um, basically, there are tools to visualize these things and. Basically, what I'm saying is, if you were to imagine individual atoms as um, Lego bricks, you kind of get a better idea of what uh, nanotechnology is all about. <laughs> nanotechnology, quantum technology, it, we, it's all, you know, you're playing with atoms. That's why people call, a, call scientists that work in the quantum field um, quantum engineers or <laughs> people who play or quantum mechanics. Like the person, uh, what I mean is a person who's acting like a mechanic, but in relation to quantum, we're playing with atoms. <laughs> so this is what this is about. Anyways, so let's move on. We have a vacuum chamber. So this is just a, a 3D representation of, of a, what a vacuum chamber does. The purpose of the vacuum chamber is to suck out the the uh, gas molecules so if you can imagine these all these little white dots that are floating around inside of this box these are molecules of gas it could be um like air mixture of nitrogen oxygen argon and 
couple of other kind of gases, whatever you find in the in the open the open atmosphere. So there's atmospheric pressure. You can measure it per square centimeter or per cubic centimeter. And then you can, when you start to draw out or suck out the air using some kind of uh, vacuum pump, like a turbine pump or some other kind of pump that gets really abstract at that point. Many kinds of pumps you can use that have various uh, abilities. Some pumps are stronger than others. Some pumps have higher or lower maintenance based on how it's designed. And basically those kind of pumps, if you if you select the correct one, then you can obtain a really, really nice vacuum inside of that chamber. Then in this case, we need something like this, uh, a high vacuum or an ultra high vacuum if we're going to play with really, really precise control of, of atomic atomics or the, the growth of these atoms. So that's what this is about. And then here is a picture that I was talking about. I was wanting to add a picture to kind of illustrate what's going on. So this, this right here is a picture of a vacuum chamber that we have in our laboratory. And this is made of stainless steel. So just in case you're wondering, what is this made of? It's not, it's not necessarily anything that special. It's just a, <laughs> a precisely machined stainless steel. That's all it is. And maybe if you're asking about the specific kind of stainless steel, it is in this case, uh, what is called a 405 stainless steel, specifically 405. And then on the right, of course, this is the component that is complementary to this left side. And this is basically, we open this vacuum chamber because we wanted to maintain it or do some servicing on this on this chamber and then replace some of the, the gaskets, these little uh, copper rings here. And those copper rings will go around this chamber and then will allow you to seal up this chamber after you bolt everything back on together. So that's that's what this is displaying here. This is the same kind of chamber that we use to grow the materials for, for quantum devices or nanostructures or you know nanomagnets, all, all kinds of things like that. But generally speaking, there is there is supposed to be a, a piece of uh, a target in here with di loaded with different kind of metals. Pick, pick whatever metal that you you need that is um, non toxic or or otherwise something that you can work with, and then you can place it in here. And then you can introduce, you can control the beam of energy at each of these little guns. So there's some like some some beams of energy that that you can control at each of these. Uh, little things that stick out of the chamber. <laughs> so that's all it is. Now, we will look at, there's this thing called a, a scanning tunneling microscope. And you will see all these little dots on the screen. So what are, what are these dots? So these dots are actually representations of the atom itself. And it's not necessarily the, you're not looking at the individual atoms or components of the atoms, but you're kind of looking at the general the general shape of an atom, because what's happening is the the electrons that is surrounding the atom, the electron cloud, is interacting with this atomic probe. So this atomic probe exists inside of a vacuum chamber. I'll show you the picture in the next slide, what that looks like. But generally speaking, you are scanning over this surface that has been grown or implanted with, with all of these atoms of silicon, in this case, and then those those electron clouds will interact with this atomic tip, this very sharp tip. So you can consider this one of the sharpest, one of the sharpest tips of or, or sharpest probes or sharpest needles in the world because <laughs> it is one atom. Uh, the, the thickness of the tip is one atom. So it's very, very sharp. You can slice. <laughs> uh, okay. So that's what that is. And then if you introduce like a voltage uh, through this probe, then you can interact with those individual electrons. So you can see here that the atoms are spaced apart, maybe mm, two, maybe one fifth of a nanometer. What does that mean? That means it's about two angstroms apart from each other, two to three angstroms apart from each other. You can look up the characteristics or the you know spec specification of, of atomic structures of silicon, and then you can actually measure the atomic distance between, or interatomic distance between these atoms. 
So this is just a, a way to look at atoms. And then here's the, the illustration of that scanning tunneling microscope that I was talking about. We call this an STM for short. A lot of abbreviations and, and um, things like that to, to call these machines because some of them have long names. But here on the right side, you can see there's a screen that's displaying, uh, it's just 2D scan of, of, these, of these atoms that are being scanned with the probe, this atomic tip. And then what it's doing is, of course, like I said, it's interacting with those electron clouds and then it is displaying it as, as data here, scanning, and it's showing on a screen. So it's a nice little animation to help illustrate the point. And this is all inside of a vacuum chamber. So in case you're wondering, where is the tunneling happening? So there is a tunneling of electrons happening between this tip and the electrons themselves. And that, that tunneling barrier that, or tunneling gap that's, that's here is just a vacuum gap, the gap of, well, vacuum. <laughs> So this is the picture of the tunneling electron microscope, scanning tunneling electron microscope. So this is from IBM research. And if you, if you want to find like really high quality pictures like this, you can go to their Flickr page. Um, I can send you those links as well if you need. It's, uh, it's open source or what is not open source. Creative Commons uh, licensing. You can basically share it. There's... Some images are copyrighted, some are not, but this one is not cop. It's, it's, it's free to use in public. So it's just, that's just something to know. Anyways, so again, here, like I said, the, you have vacuum components, and you'll notice that uh, it has all these stainless steel parts that have been machined and put together. And all of these electronic interfaces used to control that very sharp tip inside of this inside of this chamber. So that, that is where, this, this is where we uh, basically insert a sample of metal or semiconductor or some other material that is a thin film on a substrate, and then we can measure it. So this is what this looks like, is this setup. And then maybe you've seen this animation before, but this is also done with that same machine, the scanning tunneling microscope. So someone took, uh, a group of scientists at IBM Research took this, uh, some of these molecules, these atoms apart individually and were able to create a small uh, movie. Because, of course, movies are just, or videos or, what is the term, films, are simply just frames, what do they call it, motion picture. So a motion picture is the same as a video, is the same as a, a movie. So that's what this is. This is someone taking uh, one picture and then they rearrange the atoms individually, just click and drag them on, the, on this uh, screen. And then that whatever you move on the screen will correlate to what's happening inside of the vacuum chamber. So you can rearrange those, those, those little atoms and then you could take a picture or a screenshot of, what's, of, of where they are and then take another picture, rearrange them, and then take another picture. So you are actually looking at atoms here, or representations of atoms, the, uh, the interaction of the electron cloud with the, with the uh, very sharp tip, the scanning probe. So this, is, this was released a couple of years ago, uh, a number of years ago, actually, to, to show that we can control atoms, and then we can see them using very special equipment, and it requires a vacuum, some kind of vacuum environment, ultra-high vacuum in this case. So <laughs> this, this is it's just one way of looking at atoms, but the whole point is that you, 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 do actually, you actually can see atoms, and you can see them. There are little dots here, and we can move them around. We can control them. That's, that's what now technology is all about. So here we go. And then here's another, another little animation, picture, drawing, or video, it's just, uh, again, taking pictures inside of uh, another kind of electron microscope. So this electron microscope is called, or the, the setup that's used to take this image is called a transmission electron microscope. So in this case, what uh, this group 
the Jean group did was they were able to look at this uh, group of of atoms that are arranged in this crystal structure and it's it's made of cadmium cadmium uh, it's a metal and they mix it together with uh, chlorine atoms and then what happens what they realize is that there is some kind of impurity happening or there's like a a breaking point uh, on some edge of this of this crystal structure and then this crystal structure is we also call it a nanoparticle nanoparticle is just some shape it's it looks like um well it's just kind of bunched up together it's not necessarily any specific shape it's just we can consider this an island as well some some people call the some of these uh nanoscale objects an island quote unquote but that's that's what's happening here you can take videos of these atoms all these tiny little dots are the same kind of dots that we see in this in the previous picture the previous video i showed you where the atoms were moving around to make a little uh, atomic sized video <laughs> so that's what's happening here and you will you will notice that basically all metallic elements with the exception of um, mercury cesium and gallium are, are essentially crystalline solids at room temperature so they are crystals <laughs> you can you can see atoms and view atoms as as crystals they have crystalline structures and if you grow them big enough to to the point where you can see it with a naked eye then well you you'll see all these unique geometric shapes that that are basically taken from the from the smallest elements from the smallest structures within this, this these arrangements of atoms so you can see here is the scale bar obviously the atoms are less than one nanometer but this is, this is what this entails okay so here is a picture of another group of atoms so this is a picture of a what is called a magnetic tunnel junction so what is a magnetic tunnel junction it's just an arrangement of metal atoms here so you can see here there's cobalt atoms in here it's just a metal and then iron it's another metal and then boron which is a different kind of element it's non-metal and then another another layer of it above here and then here's a middle layer right here another metal magnesium mixed together with oxygen so you have an oxide layer and this oxide layer is how many atoms thick it's like what maybe 20 maybe 15 20 atoms thick you can actually count the atoms on this picture and when you see them arranged very nicely like this it's they're kind of arranged right next to each other and there's there's not a whole lot of uh, zigzagging or they're, they're not uh, going into different kind of directions it's just a nice little line lined up uh, like a like this crystal this uh, crystalline lattice um as i mentioned you can see them like like stacking up bricks if you have enough bricks and you stack them up nicely then they they start to form this nice pattern and in this case when we're when we're growing the atoms of magnesium and magnesium oxide cobalt and iron mixed together with boron inside of a vacuum chamber then we can examine the crystalline structure up close under a transmission electron microscope so there are various ways of obtaining of obtaining as you can see here the atomic resolution of those atoms and then up here you can see these these cobalt and cobalt iron boron uh, compounds of, of metal here that is disordered in this case we call them amorphous structures amorphous just means that there's no there's no particular direction that the atoms are arranged they're kind of randomly placed and you can play around with the gross temperature inside of the chamber and other kind of parameters like that to um, to obtain either amorphous or crystalline structures which is parallel to organization versus disorganization so this is a nice example of what's happening and devices similar to this are used in superconducting tunnel junctions this is just one kind of tunnel junction we will talk more about 
in next week's le lecture, we'll talk more about the different kind of tunnel junctions that exist and what they what they are used for, different purposes, things like that. So this tunnel junction here is used for magnetics, but regardless, it does use uh, quantum properties, and this tunnel barrier is a uh, is a big part of what this this device, um, the, the the device functionality. <laughs> the so let me introduce to you this concept of diffusion. So as I said in that little poem earlier, there is this thing called diffusion. And what, what is it? It's just basically like a quote-unquote melting of, of, of two different kinds of materials into each other. You can see here on the left side, there are you know, atoms moving around. And this is just a, a consequence of thermodynamics. So if you're adding heat to a sample to, or some, some energy source into a, into a sample, in this case, especially heat, um, what happens is these atoms, they start to diffuse, they start to mix together, and they cross the boundary. So there's, there's supposed to be a boundary here in the middle, but if there's no diffusion barrier, then what can happen is these, these molecules or atoms, they start to you know, trade places, <laughs> swap places. And this can greatly affect the performance of a device if you're trying to... Uh, use it for any long-term purpose, or if you're trying to create it into something that's uh, a usable project product for, you know, logic applications, memory, computing, and so forth. So this this is a problem that you have to take note of. It's it's a very it's a very important hmm, important thing to <laughs> take care of. Or sometimes maybe you want the diffusion on purpose to happen and. That you can take advantage of that by simply maybe introducing uh, heat into the system. You basically put it into an oven and bake it. <laughs> when you bake it, it will start to do things like this. And then here on the right side, there's, there's the diffusion barrier. Maybe you don't want the atoms to fuse or diffuse into each other, these, these two layers of materials. So what you would do in this case is introduce this this layer of, of of some some other hard material and then you would grow it between here so maybe in this case there's no specific example of what the diffusion barrier is made of but um, there is one that that you can use which is tantalum like uh, some kind of nitride material tantalum nitride which i used in the previous lecture basically you can grow a layer of tantalum nitride material here, 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 and here, all simultaneously inside of the deposition chamber after doing patterning and lithography processes. And then that will allow you to create a, a barrier or, or this uh, line of material that will prevent this, in this case, copper from diffusing or sort of quote-unquote melting into this into this uh, semiconductor layer. So if you have a semiconductor layer here, this gray area, then you don't want it to be uh, mixed with with those other impurities that are already in it. So this is this is the kind of method that you would do inside of the vacuum chamber. So that's what that does. So now let's move on to this unique idea of using, well, nature as an inspiration for building new kinds of nanotechnology, even for thin films. So, so here we can see, look, there's a, there's a gecko, there's a, a lizard. And on the lizard, the, the foot or the feet of the lizard, there are these things called setae. It's just, it's just uh, tiny little hairs that branch out, kind of like fractals. It's like a little tree. And then when you examine it under an electron microscope like this here on the right, then you can see all of these tiny little structures that that exist on the ends of those hairs, and it turns out that the there's all these little hairs simply increase the the contact area or the surface area between the the feet and the toes of this uh, lizard and whatever the lizard's trying to climb. So maybe the lizard's trying to climb a piece of glass or a, maybe a wall or a window <laughs> or a tree, anything really. 
the, the lizard will be able to climb up those objects, those smooth objects, without having to, you know, stick its hand into uh, some something like uh, sticky glue. So you can basically behave, create a surface that behaves like glue that has adhesion properties without actually using sticky glue. And now all of this is done by means of introducing these tiny little hairs, like increasing the surface area. So here is a, a nice practical example of what that does. This is an uh, experiment that I did here in my office. So on the back side of my office, there is a refrigerator. And on that refrigerator, I stuck four pieces of this tape, which is called a gecko tape or nano tape. It has two different names. But this tape, there you can slice it with the you know scissor, and it's it costs about eight dollars, eight maybe ten dollars for this roll of tape, a uh, bigger roll of tape, and I stuck it to this freeway, this dumbbell here, this dumbbell I have here in my office. It's about twenty-seven kilograms. So let me let me show you. This. Just to show you, I have <laughs> proof that I did the experiment. This is the dumbbell that I used. <laughs> to stick to that tape. So on the tape, um, there, there exists all of these little nanostructures or synthetic setae. I forgot the E there, don't mind that. But there, there are all these little nanostructures that exist made of some other poly, poly, uh, poly material. In this case, there's a polymide pillar that's been patterned and it's been uh, fabricated using nanotechnology tools in the laboratory to you know form these structures and then these there there are actually nanostructures on this tape there's no sticky glue that exists like you would from uh, scotch tape or maybe some other mm, some other kind of expensive tape such as silicone tape or let's see what's another example kapton tape kapton tape is another expensive tape but this one can, this particular stretchy tape, it has these structures on it that you can stick anything really heavy onto, and it'll stay there. And if you want to pull it off, you just roll the, this weight to the side, and then it'll unstick itself. And you can use it over and over and over again. You just need to cl uh, clean the surface of the tape, and you're good to go. So this is one practical application, and this is done, like I said, without you know, using actual sticky material like uh, some kind of goo so of course uh you always need to be careful when you're performing these kind of experiments you know when you're sticking heavy objects to a surface this is just a uh <laughs> service warning to you uh, be careful so let's talk about some key ingredients for thin films why do i mention all these things basically you need glue between two different materials. And so I listed that here. And in the laboratory, for example, you need to create uh, an adhesion between like a layer of gold and a layer of silicon dioxide. So if you have a wafer or even some, some other thin material that, that has been deposited with silicon dioxide, then if you put a layer of gold directly on top of it, then the gold will not stick to the silicon dioxide directly. It will, it will sort of stick to it, but the, the adhesion properties are, are very low. And what happens is if you kind of let it sit there over time and then you start to carry this little chip around or if you uh, heat it up or maybe if you sonicate it, if you try to clean the chip, then the gold will start to smear off of the chip very easily. And uh, in most cases, that's not what you want. You want the gold to stay on the chip. So the gold atoms will stay on the chip by introducing an adhesion layer. And so the adhesion or the glue, in this case, can be made of uh, actual metals. So you can select the, some of these common adhesion metals to, to stick these two materials together. So if you place titanium or chromium or uh, aluminum, tantalum, molybdenum, niobium, or even in some cases vanadium, between this layer of gold and silicon, silicon dioxide, then it will stick together and it will be very difficult to remove. <laughs> so that's one thing to, to notice and take care of 
when you're building a thin film device um when it comes to like the whole purpose is you're trying to build a, a device that has quantum properties but how are you going to use the quantum device that has quantum properties if if it doesn't stick to itself so these are things to take care of and also the thickness of that of that layer the adhesion layer should be roughly about five to ten nanometers in some in some cases you can even go down to like three nanometers but this is this is a good layer of thickness that you can use and then the other thing is there is this thing called a diffusion barrier the diffusion barrier of course it prevents i mentioned this earlier uh, this material from melting into each other and sometimes you don't want that to happen other times you want it to happen but it, in any case you need to have some kind of diffusion barrier to to uh, add some some kind of control sometimes you don't want those impurities to to exist in certain areas but you want them to exist in other areas on the chip so that's that's what you can introduce and then there are all these other kind of blockades that exist and i kind of color coded them here to help give you an idea there's this thing called a coulomb blockade or some some people have a fancy pronunciation coulomb blockade because I believe the guy is French that, that came up with this. Um, base, <laughs> a lot of these terms did a lot of work in this area, working on charge. Uh, basically, that's his name. But regardless, anything, anytime you see this word here that's spelled like this, then the purpose of that is to block out or filter some kind of charge. So electrical charge could be positive charge, negative charge, either one. That can be blocked or filtered out by introducing this layer. It, it's kind of like this diffusion barrier. It is like a very much like a barrier, but in this case, it's it serves a specific purpose. And then we also have this other one called a spin blockade. And the spin blockade, of course, it also filters out or blocks different kinds of orientation. So if the magnetics of a material has certain orientation, then we can block out or filter it from transferring from one side of, of a device to the next. And then we have another one called a phonon blockade. What is a phonon? Phonon is just the lattice vibration. It's this excitation of these uh, arrangements of atoms. So you can actually you know, inhibit or you can try to prevent these vibrations from traveling from one side of the device to the next. And that's done by a, pho a phonon blockade. And these, of course, are uh, kinds of blockades and kind of uh, barriers that are used in quantum devices. In many kind of like quantum dots, you can find Coulomb blockades and even spin blockades that exist. You can identify them and then you can point out, okay, that's what the Coulomb blockade does, is what the spin blockade does. Um, so that's just to, to help you, you know, understand what what purposes each part of the device serves. And then as a bonus, there are two bonuses I put here. That is the seed layer. So the seed layer, you can place on the bottom, like it's the first or foundational, maybe on top of the foundation, because what I would consider the foundation of the device is the, the wafer itself. So the substrate, the supporting layer, uh, sometimes there are different kinds of materials that, that need to have some kind of crystal direction. And if you want to modify that or change that, then it can be done by introducing a seed layer. A seed layer is just there to, in this case, help with that with that growth direction. And then the, the other purpose you can use the seed layer for is you can, you can even use it maybe <laughs> temporarily as a as a like a channel a bottom channel if you wanted to you know introduce signals or read do a readout or maybe do some kind of um, signal detection inside of the device so that can be done with the seed layer and then here there is a another bonus i want to introduce and that is called thermal annealing what is that i just mentioned it earlier which is you're placing a chip inside of a chamber, and then you're, you're, it's like you're baking a chamber. You're, you're baking 
heating up to a baking temperature and then you're baking the chip. <laughs> you are baking chips, essentially. And then what that what that does is it will allow you to reorganize the atoms. They can they can arrange themselves and become crystalline structures, or maybe, maybe not. It's it's all experimental, but maybe you have some idea or hint through uh, numerical methods or through calculation, like 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 through physics, you can say, "Oh, this device, I think it's it it's going to have it's going to rearrange itself into a neat structure that's crystalline, that's nicely arranged." If we add heat to it, so let's try that. And you can also add heat to the device before the device is patterned or during the during the growth of the thin film itself or after the device is patterned. So there there are two di two different directions you can do with uh, thermal annealing. And then uh, I'll kind of add on top of that, I didn't write it here, but there's another one called magnetic annealing, which is just you're exposing a very strong magnetic field and that will help you to reorganize uh, some of these properties of those atoms, such as the spin and, and things like that. That is in the thin film. Okay, so we are very close to the end here. And here's a picture of, I believe this is done in Blender. I, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty positive that this is done in Blender. Here is a, a representation of atoms. So this is supposed to be a nanoparticle. And this nanoparticle, of course, contains a, a group or arrangement of all of these atoms. So these tiny little balls that you can see here in this rendered image is a representation of atoms. And here, this, of course, I mentioned earlier in the previous lecture that the transistor is like a, it's like a switch. You can behave like, make it behave like a switch or even a, uh, an amplifier, a signal amplifier. So in this case, here, there are two, two bottom images. If we, maybe I can zoom into it a little bit. We can see here, there's a tiny little dot and this dot is uh, it's a nanoparticle here is a, a close-up image of this nanoparticle. And what this is showing is that we can have, um, you know, structures that we can control uh, and make into a, a transistor. And this is done by fabrication methods. And all of this is grown with thin film technology. That's the whole point. So. You can make a device like this by introducing those principles that we uh, mentioned throughout this entire lecture. So I hope that was uh, helpful. Also, the scale bar, I could have swore I put the numbers on here, but this scale bar on the left side is supposed to be uh, about 20 nanometers. And then this other scale bar on the right is supposed to be like um, maybe two nanometers or so, two to five nanometers. So. Yeah, these these devices are very, very small, very tiny. And all of these are controlled and fabricated inside of a vacuum chamber. So that's the big deal. So this is how we make quantum devices. You can apply this same concept to other kinds of quantum devices, and you can end up, and you can take pictures of it. And you can even go into Blender and import the data that has been scanned from something like this. And then you can, you can create what is called a data-driven 3D model. You can also do what is called a data-driven uh, 3D animation in which an animation is drawn or a, a rendering like this and make it into a video. And then that is driven or taken from real data points that has been scanned from a laboratory uh, environment. So, there, there are so many ways to visualize what is happening on the surface, below the surface, actually, of a, of a device. So obviously, you can see a device, a chip with your naked eye, but what's really, really inside of the chip and what's happening and how it's designed can be visualized. And we, we have methods for doing that, um, either graphically or by simply means of extracting the raw scan data like this on the right side. So. There, there are just there are really, really nice ways of playing around with nanotechnology to get a quantum device like this one. And typically, one other thing I want to point out is that 
you can use a single electron transistor as a kind of sensing device. You can like when you're using it in a for for uh, maybe like a quantum dot based uh, qubit, then what happens is you will place this single electron transistor component next to the qubit itself. And then what happens is this electron transistor will allow you to amplify the the current that is that is uh, being applied or voltage that's being applied to uh, this gating mechanism. And then the gating mechanism will activate this the charge current that's flowing between these two contacts here. So, and these are all nanoscale. So you can use this kind of like as a, like I said, a detector. Uh, they, we also call this an SET detector, single electron transistor detector. <laughs> so, and then you can read those out and then plot them on a graph and then determine whether or not there is, uh, whether or not the benchmarking is is working for a, a set of qubits, an individual qubit, whether if it's a two qubit gate or maybe some some other experimental kind of qubit gate, this is this can be done, and this is what this device is used for. So that is the end of the lecture here, and uh, basically we went over some material science ideas, and we looked at some of the imaging techniques. Well, not not too in detail because in a in a later lecture in a couple of weeks we'll talk about the more in depth detail of what the imaging techniques. Uh, the principal functions of those imaging techniques are through animation. <laughs> and then uh, we'll have more pictures of more devices uh, at every scale, in this case, that we're using for quantum hardware. And then there's a lot of inspection, of course, when we're building quantum devices in the laboratory. There's this a lot of atomic resolution You'll hear this term atomic resolution, which is basically we can look at atoms inside of a nano device and we can inspect them using those techniques like transmission electron microscope, scanning transmission electron microscope, scanning tunneling electron microscope, all of which requires some kind of vacuum chamber. And it's a, a really good, really good clean environment. And that's why we have these rooms called clean rooms. They, they're just they're, they're just really filtered out. We try to filter out all the, the dust particles in the air so that we can do these kind of measurements and fabrication. So the other thing is, of course, we can take some, some hints from nature. Nature in itself has a lot of unique properties. Nature itself has a lot of very unique approaches to obtaining a certain level of efficiency and for for doing things that are not not so obvious to the to the naked eye but by questioning and staying curious about what what nature is doing at the below the surface or at the atomic level or nanoscale you know we we can inspect it with these atomic resolution microscopes and then just see what's happening and then take inspiration from there to create a better kind of quantum device or some other nano device that has quantum properties that will be used for efficient emerging technologies and better and, and even cleaner kinds of uh, chips that are more sustainable things like that you can take it in any direction that you'd like it's all up to you and you know we we there's a lot of precision control that's involved as well so that's uh th that's that's about rats wraps it up here and next the next lecture for next week we'll be talking about a range of quantum devices using pictures uh, animations atomic resolution microscopy things like that and you'll you'll have a clearer idea of what the these quantum devices look like and what surface what purposes that they serve so that is all thank you very much everyone uh, I will be glad to take all of the questions. So I think now we can take the questions if people have. Oh, someone was asking. I remember. Someone was asking about um, 
the name of something. I think just Dink something. Dinker, Dinkercat, Dinkercat. Let me let me double check on my. If it's Tinkercad, yeah, it is Tinkercad.com. Okay. <laughs> I was trying to remember if it was Tinkercad.com or Tinkercad.org. So it's Tinkercad.com. That's the name of the website. So that's that's the website actually that's that's used for making the for making the Lego representations. But if you want to do if you want to convert a video into a, a GIF or GIF, sorry, then what you need to do do is go to another website called cloud convert and cloud convert is just uh let's see here it's 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 just a site for uploading series of images or videos and then you can convert that into um well a gif an animation that will play itself over and over and over again and of course uh you can you can even take a, a video that's been animated in a program like Blender or some some other maybe like uh, Fusion 360, then you can use that and also convert it into a GIF to use in your presentations. So that that is also available. Yeah. Uh, can I ask a practical question? Yes, please. Um, yeah, actually, I'm uh, super interested in this course, but it's a really, really busy period, so I mm -hmm. could only catch this course for in half. But will there be a, a recordings and um, available later somewhere? Oh yes, yes. All of these sessions right. are recorded and up. We'll, we're uploading it to YouTube. And, uh, uh, yeah. Is it like live uh, on Quantum Grad? Like uh, the the, the first one is live on Quantum Grad right now, but the live stream is only done here on Zoom. And then the the recording is uploaded to YouTube. So, yeah. And also in the same account. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it's mm -hmm. a really great course. Uh... Yeah, no problem. Yeah, so here I'm just pasting the uh, tutorial one link. So similar kind of like in a couple of these, like uh, this tutorial will be also uploaded to Quantum Grad. See, did I miss <clears throat> did I miss any other questions? <laughs> uh oh yeah, we got that one. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah we so all the questions, so maybe we can stop recording and yeah. Okay, wonderful. All right. Well, uh catch you next time. Let me turn off the recording here. Uh I'm not no, I'm not leaving the call just yet. Just <laughs> yeah, just yeah, listen, just stop recording and we can talk. Yeah.